So this is Taylor Mason. I'm here today with Representative Chris Rabb. This is an ongoing oral history project on the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus and its impact on members and staff. Thank you so much for taking time to do this today. My pleasure. So let's start by doing a little background about yourself. Just tell me a little bit about how you got to the house, um, career education, anything like that. I was elected to the Pennsylvania House of Representatives uh, in November of 2016 um, and uh, uh, started my work in earnest in 2017. Uh, I believe I came in into the smallest uh, House Democratic Caucus in 60 years. Uh, it was uh, amidst a, a new political moment that had a lot of people um, on edge and particularly in my district in Upper Northwest Philadelphia, where I represent uh, three neighborhoods, Chestnut Hill, Mount Airy, and West Oak Lane. Um, my predecessor was uh, an incumbent who served only for a few months and her successor, uh, um, her predecessor rather, uh, is council member Sherelle Parker who served uh, the 200th for I believe 11 years and um, my district is known for a number of things, uh, most notably uh, being one of the vo highest voter turnout districts in the state, um, and also claiming a very um, uh, uh, longstanding um, black middle class and a racially integrated neighborhood that has been intentionally racially integrated since the late 50s, early 60s, uh, and that's Mount Airy. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's a great district to represent. It's green, diverse, uh, and like I said, very civically engaged um, and very, um, uh, just a, a warm community to represent. Uh, so a little bit about my background. I'm not a native Pennsylvanian. I adopted Philadelphia as my home 20 years ago. It's where I bought my first house. It's where I became a father, uh, where I went to grad school. So a lot of my most meaningful firsts happened in Philadelphia. And I've been in the same house uh, for 20 years, which is the longest I've been under the same roof anywhere, uh, having lived and traveled um, and worked um, all over uh, the country. Um, I was born and raised in Chicago, was raised in a very civically engaged family, and so service has always meant a great deal to me. Uh, this is my third term in office. And uh, I've, I have found that this is far more than a job. This is more of a calling. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, have quickly learned the distinction between politicians and public servants. Um, and I like to count myself in that latter group. Um, and having the opportunity to join an entity um, uh, that is the Black Legislative, uh, Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus has been a, a true uh, pleasure and uh, an extraordinary resource. And as someone who used to work in the United States Senate and was a member of the Senate Legislative um, Staffers Black Caucus, uh, I feel like I've come full circle. I remember being a rare black staffer in the United States Senate. And I was fortunate to work for the first black woman Senator Carol Mosley Braun from Illinois. Um, and I would later become her liaison to the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, so it was the first time that there was Senate representation in the Black Caucus because I believe her only black predecessor preceded the uh, creation of the Black Caucus, if I, if my, if I recall correctly. So it was uh, uh, over the course of, you know, 25 years, uh, I've gone from uh, an entry level uh, Senate staffer to becoming a state lawmaker. And uh, I still keep in touch with my first boss, Senator Carol Mosley Braun. Okay. Well, my next question is, um, and maybe you can elaborate on this since you've been in Congress as well, but what has been your experience being a person of color in the Pennsylvania House? Do you think there were extra obstacles in 
becoming elected or even when you were here in office and when you're here now do you, with legislation or committee work, anything like that? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's hard for me to answer because I'm used to navigating predominantly white institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, having attended Yale and the University of Pennsylvania, having worked in uh, predominantly white environments, um, you know, pretty much all my life. Um, this is the norm for me, so it doesn't feel particularly different, um, which also means it doesn't feel particularly better. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'm yeah. used to feeling uh, um, uh, uh, a certain place um, uh, along the margins, but I don't easily accept that reality. So. Um, I would think that the bigger issue practically is uh, being uh, a Democrat from Philadelphia, which has been far more marginalizing than being black. I think um, the issues I raise that are, hard, that are highly germane to African-Americans and other people of color is probably um, a, a notable distinction. In other words, uh, it's one thing to be black um, uh, and a legislator. It's another to be black and to be unapologetically um, advocating for the needs of, of vulnerable communities. And so in response to that um, consistent and explicit advocacy, you know, there is obvious pushback, but um, uh, I'm used to it and uh, I lean into it. Okay, thank you. You mentioned your district, the 200, which is portions of Philadelphia County and city. Um, very historic district. You mentioned a few of your predecessors. Could you elaborate more on what it's like being in such a well-known district in terms of its membership? Sure. Well, originally my district, um, the neighborhoods that my district um, has covered um, have been from, um, predominantly white and um, with a, a, a strong Jewish enclave that um, as a result of white flight into the suburbs um, and migration of, of black communities um, from North Philly and other parts uh, became a predominantly black um, uh, uh, area uh, for the past 30 years. So my earliest um, uh, kind of predecessors in the modern era, really since the 50s and 60s, um, they were Jewish. Um, and, uh, and then John White Jr. was the first African-American legislator to represent this district. Um, and uh, uh, since then, uh, and after he left, all of my predecessors have been black women. So there is no glass ceiling in the yeah. 200. Um, and I'm really proud of that. The first thing I did when I took office and opened up my district office was I put pictures of all of my predecessors um, going back 50 years. I wanted people to see that um, the district office is not my office per se. Uh, it belongs to the people of the 200th legislative district. And, and I wanted everyone to know um, who preceded me um, pro to provide that kind of historical context. I also, um, I'm a big maps person, so I have a map of the legislative district. And pre-pandemic, uh, when uh, constituents would come into my office for the first time or people had just moved into the neighborhood, I would welcome them and I'd say, help me find where you live on the map. And I was like, oh, okay, that's where you are. This is where I live. And I'd point to my house and then I'd say, okay, and here we are in the district office and um, just let people know that um, being a state rep, um, there's a certain level of uh, intimacy and accessibility that folks have, particularly in Philadelphia, that is even more intimate than a council person because a council person represents over 150,000 people, maybe close to 200,000, whereas we just represent roughly you know, 63,000 folks and across you know, three fairly dense neighborhoods. So. Um, I want to kind of play into the fact that, you know, we're all neighbors here um, and um, have visual representations 
of how we're connected. Okay. Well, um, you kind of elaborated on this too, but what was your relationship like with your predecessors? Did any of them play a mentor role for you, show you the ropes, show you how the political process worked in the House? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's see here. Do you, did any other members, maybe in other Philly districts, were they mentor roles for you? Did they play a mentor role for you? Maybe not necessarily your district, as you mentioned, but outside of that. Yeah, I, you know, there've been so many people, and I, I mentioned earlier about the distinction between politicians and public servants. Mm -hmm. One of the lessons I, I learned very quickly was how to identify uh, the two. And what I learned was it was very easy to do so. And it's really the questions that people asked me. So it wasn't people who I necessarily knew beforehand, but when I first came to Harrisburg, the folks who I immediately gravitated to were the ones who asked me about my background, my interests, my priorities, my legislative um, interests, um, and you know why I sought to serve. That those questions revealed a lot about the person asking the questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for folks who just wanted um, kind of less substantive kind of insight about me, um, you know, are, are folks who, who have not proven to be uh, mentors or, or partners, but the ones who really sought to um, understand my brand of public service and how they might be able to uh, positively influence me in terms of the work uh, I seek to do in collaboration with others in, in Harrisburg. And so that has been a number of people, you know, working in the, the largest full-time state legislature in the country means that there's a lot of people who you can go to for advice and, and collaboration. So I've been very fortunate um, to find that uh, those supports um, within and beyond uh, the Black Caucus. Okay, great, that's interesting to share that. Um, how have you been involved with the Black Caucus? I know you served as treasurer for um, a term, but could you elaborate on your service with them and what roles you took in the caucus? So, yes, um, I was an officer in my first term and, you know, I found myself kind of uh, spreading myself thinly. So I really decided to pivot um, since then and be a, a, a support behind the scenes. So naturally, um, I, I come and support the events and initiatives of the Black Caucus. Um, uh, the chairwoman, the current chairwoman, uh, Representative Donna Bullock, has asked me to speak on behalf of the caucus in certain situations, um, um, working on legislation. So things that relate to um, the Black community that either I have proposed or worked on uh, with officers of the Black Caucus. Uh, I have spoken on behalf of those initiatives, um, whether it's on the House floor or at rallies or uh, press events. Um, and then um, more behind the scenes legislatively um, and from an analytics perspective, I have uh, uh, collaborated through my team uh, with caucus staff around looking at uh, uh, the number of sponsorships, uh, the number of bills that get introduced or kind of uh, further move through the process uh, among Black Caucus members. So kind of the wonky analytics side of things um, I've provided. And then when I was able to staff um, the House Democratic Caucus Equity Committee, which I founded in 2018, I was able to provide that institutional support to the Black Caucus and other affinity caucuses to look at issues around racial justice and social equity so that the information we provide um, staff and members can help guide um, what they do to be more productive um, and effective. Okay. Um, this question might be a little different since you have not been here as, as long, but do you think the caucus has changed at all during your tenure? In just a short amount of years you've been here, do you see any changes or 
hope for any changes in the future? Um, well, I would say really since the uprisings of the summer of 2020, um, in the aftermath of the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others, um, that there's been uh, an intensity and a focus, particularly under um, our current chair, um, um, a level of um, substance and clarity and resolve that is very um, inspiring. Um, and I also feel that um, our collective influence on how um, members of uh, uh, both caucuses weigh in on issues that disproportionately impact uh, black folk has been significant. I think that um, we've been uh, better at getting out early on issues and letting our colleagues know where we stand and why it's important to be in solidarity with, with our position whenever possible. So I have definitely seen that over the course of five and a half years. And <clears throat> my, my, um, my hope is that its influence um, and reach uh, will continue. And I have every reason to believe that that will be the case. Um, this is, that was a great segue into Black Caucus took over the rostrum in 2020. Um, could you explain how that took place, your involvement in that movement, and do you think it was successful after you took over the rostrum? Well, um, so that um, uh, that nonviolent act of civil disobedience uh, was not actually a Black Caucus initiative. It was um, black members um, <laughs> at the, um, but that was not sanctioned by the Black Caucus or the House Democrats, um, specifically to keep those organizations out of trouble. So it was uh, an independent um, uh, um, act of uh, a number of, of black lawmakers um, and some of our <clears throat> non-Black allies who assisted um, in, in quiet but important ways. Um, uh, and it was, and I definitely think that that inspired um, the Black Caucus to really double down in its leadership around racial justice issues. Um, uh, and the other interesting point too uh, uh, from that um, direct action, it was largely newer people um, who, um, who led and organized that. It was, um, you know, normally we have a very kind of hierarchical um, kind of approach where um, folks with more seniority um, are at the table. This was more, um, grassroots, uh, more, uh, not quite impromptu because there was definitely planning involved, but it, it, it happened in a, uh, in a different way than most initiatives occur in Harrisburg. And so it kind of sidestepped the usual protocols. One was because we had to act quickly and with great discretion. And the other, we wanted to provide um, some um, plausible deniability as it were, because we, we didn't want to uh, negatively impact um, our allies um, in leadership and in the Black Caucus, um, um, because what we were doing uh, was controversial and it was not something that everyone supported uh, or participated in, in the Black Caucus. So um, it, was, um, uh, it was a historic moment we thought that we'd have to be um, holding it down for hours, but within 90 minutes, um, the Speaker of the House said, you know, let's talk. We demanded immediate legislative action around police accountability, and we were prepared to do whatever we needed to do um, nonviolently in, in, in the spirit of, of civil disobedience, which has been at the heart of all social justice movements in our country. Um, so we stood by that, but like I said, um, things turned around pretty quickly 
And within 36 days of taking over the rostrum, we were able to enact um, uh, uh, four democratic bills uh, merged into two um, that were enacted into law that addressed police accountability. Uh, one of which was legislation that I had worked on for a number of years around uh, a police misconduct database. And that wouldn't have happened uh, without the support of the Black Caucus. Um, and most certainly was inspired by the tens of thousands of Pennsylvanians who came out um, to exercise their First Amendment rights around the state uh, in, uh, in furtherance of racial justice and police accountability. Okay. I've been showing something to all the members to get your perspective. This is a picture of the Black Caucus from 1983 to 1984. Um, just what your thoughts are, if, you, if any stories come to mind when you see these members, um, just your thoughts at the moment on this picture. Well, um, there are at least uh, two folks who, who I know on here. Um, my, one of my predecessors, Gordon Linton, mm -hmm. um, who, has, who has been a mentor. Uh, and I see my Congressman Dwight Evans, uh, longtime uh, appropriations chair, and of course uh, uh, Speaker Irvis, who I I have I had never met before, but I, I'm I have my office is in a building named after him, and I'm very mm -hmm. proud about that. But I also see a gentleman here who uh, I've probably heard the most about uh, because um, my district is adjacent to the district he represented for many years, and that's David P. Richardson. Mm -hmm. I've never heard more people speak more highly of a state lawmaker than David P. Richardson. And probably one of the, the greatest compliments I've ever received from some folks um, is that um, my brand of leadership is uh, reminiscent of his. Uh, he was a troublemaker in the best sense of the word. Um, he was unapologetically black and progressive and community minded. And I would have loved to have the honor to have met him. Um, and he also was the first person I believe in, in the state legislature to ever introduce anything around reparations. Um, he introduced a, a resolution that urged um, uh, support for HR 40, which is uh, which was a federal resolution that was introduced for decades unsuccessfully um, by Congressman, former Congressman John Conyers of Detroit. Um, and only recently has there uh, been uh, a hearing on HR 40, which is about uh, reparations and studying reparations from a federal level. That work has inspired my legislation to put forth um, a bill to address reparations for systemic racism and slavery in Pennsylvania. So um, it, that is what comes to mind when I see this august mm -hmm. group of, of black lawmakers who uh, made my job that much easier. Yeah. This is a great photo. Yeah, it's a, one of my so many iconic members on this one photo. Indeed. My final question for you then, you kind of touched on this as well, but how has the Black Caucus impacted your overall house service thus far? Um, so there's a, a large overlap between the Black Caucus and Philadelphia members, um, but it's also been a great way to engage other members who are not from Philadelphia. Um, where it's not about territoriality, but it's a perspective influenced a lot by social identity and culture, which brings a level of connectedness uh, among members who, who don't represent, um, um, you know, the same neck of the woods. So it's been a great way to engage folks from Pittsburgh, from York, Chester, um, uh, you know, the, the counter colleagues of Philadelphia that otherwise wouldn't necessarily happen. And also um, in moments that are tense or challenging, 
um, to have a level of emotional comfort and commiseration. And I'll never forget, it was a hard week. It's a really, really hard week um, uh, in Harrisburg. And this was um, before the pandemic. And, um, uh, and the, the type of uh, the challenges um, that we all process are significant. But when you're black in Harrisburg and you're fighting sometimes within your own party, within your own caucus, to demand the type of attention and care around issues that are deeply impacting our constituencies, um, sometimes it feels um, uh, just very challenging. And there was a moment where a number of black members came together just to check in with each other, just in terms of self-care, in terms of our emotional sustenance. And it was very moving because we're always talking about policy or things going on back, back home in the district, but this was deeply personal. And the way that we processed um, these challenges was unique because they're, you, you can't ever remove race or gender or class from things. They may not be explicit, but they're always there. And it was just a moment where a number of us were able to connect as people, um, as parents, as folks who are trying to juggle all of these balls and knowing that there was that, that safety net and that feeling of um, care for one another was just really moving. And, and, and uh, not surprisingly, that was voiced by um, a rep who would become our current chair. And that was Rep Donna Bullock, who just demanded of ourselves that we check in so that we know that we're, we're doing all right. And if we weren't, how we might be able to help. And that would have been possible if it weren't for the Black Caucus um, and the kind of um, trust that uh, has come with that affiliation.